Thank you for joining our webinar on prompting LLMs using Haystack. This webinar is going to be by Vladimir, who is one of our software engineers who works on Haystack, our open source NLP framework. And we're going to be talking about experimenting with prompt node and how you can create your own prompt templates. Essentially, how you can interact with large language models, uh, which is becoming increasingly important these days. So without further ado, Vladimir, could you please switch over to the next slide and I will do some quick admin and then I will hand it over to you. Um, if you can. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So uh, just as a reminder, the session is being recorded. So we will hopefully have it up on YouTube as soon as possible after the webinar is finished. Um, if you have any direct questions for Vladimir while he is speaking, please use the Q&A uh, and we will either respond to you if it's something we can answer immediately, or we will leave it to the end and we will ask Vladimir in the Q&A session. And hopefully we should have a survey at the end of the webinar too. So please, if you can, do share your feedback with us. We are also keeping the chat enabled so we can chat along um, as, as Vladimir is speaking. But yes, if you do have any direct questions about the presentation, if there's anything of interest to you with regards to prompting, prompting and prompt templates, put those in Q&A and we'll either take care of that immediately or ask Vladimir at the end. So with that, Vladimir, I'm going to hand it over to you. I will stop sharing my video and see you later. All right, thank you, Tuana, for that intro. Uh, today's topic is, Tuana has already mentioned, is going to be prompting LLMs using uh, Haystack. And uh, I want to, once again, uh, say uh, hi to everyone. I'm super excited to discuss uh, LLMs, uh, prompting LLMs with you today. And I have partitions today, uh, today's presentation in roughly four or five uh, sections. First, we'll have a quick overview of the current, let's call it Cambrian explosion of large language models and most likely changes that they're going to introduce into our uh, everyday lives. Then we're going to move on to the art of uh, prompt engineering, or more specifically, we will look into the uh, fundamentals behind um, iterating, ultimately uh, creating a successful prompt. But rather than picking up these latest uh, ticks and trips uh, uh, from the uh, online forums, uh, we're going to write these prompts with understanding of the underlying principles and we look into some of the most important concepts uh, in transformers architectures that will uh, help us uh, write these uh, prompts after we have covered these uh, fundamentals uh, the guidelines uh, for prompt writing will be more or less uh, self-evident uh, after this we'll look at some of the common uh, prompting uh, pitfalls things not to do when uh, prompting your llms We'll briefly look at some latest research and then we'll conclude with the uh, list of resources uh, for you to continue this journey and uh, question and answer. All right, so let's start with the introduction. Uh, one of the uh, coolest quotes about prompt engineering that I found is from the Andre Karpati, who's a former director of uh, Tesla AI and the uh, recent returning into the uh, to open ai a few months ago he tweeted that the hottest new programming language is uh, english and this hottest new programming language of course is he's referring to is uh, prompt engineering or simply uh, prompting enables us to uh, issue natural language requests to uh, in english or in other languages to large language models uh, and thus elicit responses from, uh, from them. But before we take a more uh, a studious look into the uh, prompt engineering, I would briefly uh, touch on LLMs in just a few sentences only. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but uh, we have uh, a two divided camps of researchers when it comes to defining uh, LLMs. Um, and uh, one of the, at one of the spectrum, we have a group of researchers and engineers who claim that these uh, large language models are nothing more than uh, statistical parrots, as they call them, while other end of the spectrum, we have a group of researchers that are, well, albeit smaller group of researchers who are already claiming that these uh, large language models are sentient uh, entities. I believe that the right answer is somewhere uh, in between. 
And although it may seem that uh, uh, during uh, training, LLMs are just learning these statistical correlations between the words, LLMs actually, I think, learn compressed uh, abstract representation of the world that we live in, uh, reflecting all of the knowledge uh, and the biases that are present in the uh, training data. As we speak, LLMs are being integrated into the uh, consumer products, but even new uh, entire platforms are being uh, created. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the chat GPT, but I don't know if you've uh, followed the news. There has been an announcement regarding uh, chat GPT plugins, which is creating this ecosystem that David Sachs, one of the most prominent Silicon Valley uh, uh, VCs just last week, referred to this platform as, and I quote, most important developer platform since iPhone and the launch of iOS and the App Store, end quote. Uh, without a doubt, uh, LLMs will likely lead to the increased productivity. Everybody is even talking about these, uh, 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 talking about imminent arrival of these uh, 10x engineers that we are all supposed to become now uh, when the LLMs enable us to increase our productivity uh, so much. Uh, then we'll definitely witness some of these um, uh, uh, personal learning experiences uh, uh, tailored with LLMs. And uh, in the midst of this, there will certainly be some ethical concerns um, and potential challenges that we're going to face as a society. Uh, regardless, uh, where does prompting uh, come into this? Well, prompting is a critical skill to harness the power of LLMs and to develop uh, groundbreaking uh, LLM, uh, NLP applications uh, effectively. In the upcoming sections, we'll go through the uh, some of the principles of the uh, good prompt engineering, all while using uh, uh, one of the central abstractions in the uh, LLM APIs uh, in Haystack, which are the prompt node and the prompt template. Okay, so what are, what are these uh, uh, abstractions that we use in Haystack, prompt node and prompt template? Well, prompt uh, node is... Uh, a central abstraction that hides the complexity of, of uh, making invocations on LLMs from its uh, users. With prompt node, we can use all of these uh, familiar models, starting uh, with chat GPT that's ever present in the media now, but also more specialized models like these text da Vinci models or hugging face models. And soon we are going to add support for uh, hugging face inference models. Uh, uh, comment co uh, model from Cohere and the Claude model from uh, Entropic. Prompt template, on the other hand, refers to is a component that uh, helps us build these flexible prompts, but not only with the simple variable uh, replacement capabilities, um, but we are also adding a limited set of fun uh, functions that can help users build more effective prompts uh, directly. In today's presentation, we'll see not only this simple variable uh, template injection, but also we'll see how we can, for example, join a list of documents into a, a block of text and uh, then use it uh, to construct the final prompt which is being sent to the uh, large language model. Okay, so, um, I believe that the foundation of any successful endeavor uh, begins with a deep understanding of the core underlying uh, principles. And uh, before proceeding any further, I would suggest that we dive together into this fascinating world of uh, large language uh, models and reveal some of these uh, crucial roles that the context window, size, and the attention mechanism uh, play in the shaping of our prompts uh, and model responses. So what is this mystical context window or, or input length or, or sequence length that everybody's talking about? And the best analogy I could think of is that if you imagine that you're reading a long article on your uh, smartphone, but the screen can only display a limited number of words and sentences at a time. And as you uh, scroll through the text, some of the words will go out of the view while the new 
words are coming into the view on your smartphone. And the number of words that you can see on the screen at once is would be equivalent of what the context window or the sequence length is the in LLM. It's the uh, number of tokens, maximum number of tokens that the model can process in a single forward pass of the network. And usually this is uh, 512 tokens, um, although uh, Flan uh, uh, T5 models using are using these uh, uh, attention mechanism that can process even more depending on your uh, memory. But this was, this was kind of a, a standard uh, until uh, very recently. And these 500 tokens are approximately 350, 400 words uh, of text. Some of these newer models like Text Da Vinci have a context window of 4,000 uh, tokens, while the latest ones uh, the default setting for GPT-4 is 8,000 tokens, while in some special variants of the model, they can even process uh, 32,000 tokens approximately, which is about 50 pages of uh, text. Now, the crucial thing to remember about the context window is that both prompt and the response have to fit into this window, not just most people have this uh, idea that only prompt needs to fit into this context window. And um, this is important to remember because when the, the prompt and the response are too long, the LLMs are going to lose the ability to co comprehend these earlier parts of the prompt that go out of the context window. And as it processes the later parts of the uh, response and a the prompt, they might, they might have a reduced uh, understanding of the whole prompt and the uh, the incorrect uh, uh, response that it might create. And understanding these limitations is uh, crucial in, design, is in, in designing effective prompts that fit into this model uh, sequence. Attention mechanism on the right-hand side uh, of, the, uh, of this slide refers to um, ability of large language models to focus on different parts of the prompt or the sentence in this case and establish relationships between these tokens that we just talked about. So this is the example that I borrowed from the uh, famous NLP educator, Jay Alamar. And in this sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. What is it referring to? Well, the attention mechanism uh, is solving this ambiguity for us. It does not refer to the street. It refers to the animal, and we can tell that by the uh, uh, by the color, the, the strongest connection between it and the uh, between the it is the animal, not the street or it itself. And uh, one thing that uh, to remember is that this is the uh, all to all relationship, and you can imagine uh, that uh, uh, this web of connection is going to get pre. Uh, attention connection is going to get pretty overwhelming uh, fast if your prompt is uh, too long. And if you're using uh, uh, prompts that are uh, complicated, uh, uh, um, that are using not familiar words or even patterns of the words uh, together, the attention mechanism is going to likely have a hard time establishing uh, relationships and ultimately a relationship between tokens and ultimately leading to uh, less accurate uh, responses. Okay, so having this understanding of uh, context uh, window limitations and the attention mechanism from the large language model transformer architecture, I would ask uh, you, what is the most important aspect of a good prompt? And, and um, I would answer that the, these should be, uh, that the prompts should be clear and specific, that crafting clear and specific prompts is essential for guiding LLMs towards desired uh, responses as the ambiguous or vague instructions, like our first attempt here to write this po poem about Haystack um, uh, might lead to irrelevant or even unhelpful responses, as we can see. So in the upper part of this slide, what I uh, was doing is creating a prompt node with text Da Vinci model and issuing a simple prompt uh, to write a short poem about Haystack. And you can see that I'm introducing a lot of bias here 
uh, thinking that uh, that uh, this model already knows what kind what haystack am I referring to, and the uh, uh, as I'm making an obvious mistake, you can see the response is totally unrelated uh, to the actual poem that I wanted to create about haystack. Now, what if what happens if I'm a little bit more clear and specific what I want? I'm introducing in the second part of this slide, in the prompt, I'm introducing a clear instruction that I'm referring to the open source NLP framework, and I'm being specific what I, where I want to nudge this uh, LLM uh, in this poem, and I'm wanting to include a little bit uh, uh, part about prompt node and its par powerful uh, templating mechanism. And uh, as you can see, in the second attempt of this prompt, I'm, uh, I was able to elicit an interesting poem about uh, NLP, haystack, prompt node, and the templates. So in conclusion, I would say that clarity refers to using simple, unambiguous language that helps model understand prompts uh, better and generate more accurate uh, responses. Avoiding jargon or overly uh, complex vocabulary ensures that the model doesn't misinterpret uh, the prompt or to provide irrelevant uh, uh, information. While, on the other hand, specificity refers to defining a well-defined prompt that narrows down the, uh, the topic, the context, making it more precise and, and targeted. And by using these special conditions, the model can focus then on generating responses uh, that directly reflect the, the, uh, the subject matter, the topic, and thus reducing the chances of going into the answer space that we don't, don't want to push it to. Okay, so now um, I want to tell you an interesting story about last year in uh, large language models. There was an interesting uh, paper from researchers from Tokyo University that published a paper in introducing uh, and a simple idea of using uh, uh, leading words, such as think it step by step. So let's also jump into the, uh, this prompt node example where uh, in the first part of the upper part of this uh, a slide, I'm trying to issue a prompt that uh, introduces this simple mathematical uh, riddle, but I'm giving instruction to a model uh, to basically tell me just the, just the result. I don't want to see any, anything else. This is something that people usually do because they might want to kind of uh, uh, have an easier uh, time processing the response. So they inadvertently kind of try to force the model to respond with the uh, uh, single word output answers. And as you can see, the, uh, the, this is not the correct, two is not the correct answer to this um, uh, problem. And we can elicit uh, the right response if we add some of these leading words, like think step by step. And in the second part, you can actually see that the model is actually going through uh, steps to actually then arrive to the right response of 2.33. Uh, so how is this how is this possible? You know what's the what's the trick here? And the best analogy uh, I could think of is that our own human reasoning. If we are forced to uh, do complex reasoning in our uh, head and then come up with an answer, we are likely also to make a mistake. And uh, if we write down all of our steps uh, in these reasoning kind of complex problems, it's on a piece of paper, uh, it is much easier to come up uh, with the uh, right answer. And it's similar to with the large language models. So here we're asking this complex problem, relatively complex problem, and uh, asking a model to make a, a best guess while we are allowing it to be a little bit more chatty it can, this autoregressive uh, uh, nature of large language models is helping itself uh, to feed these tokens from the uh, output and uh, help it navigate to the right uh, uh, response space and come up with the right answer. So just keep this in mind uh, whenever you are trying to uh, elicit a single word outputs from the models. Now you might say, okay, this is an old model, text Da Vinci 03, it's a year old. 
uh, chat, uh, sorry, GPT-4, it, was, it has a trillion, one trillion parameters, or I don't know how many they're hiding it, uh, uh, the right number of parameters. And uh, it has 32,000 uh, uh, tokens. It can process 32,000 tokens in its context window. Surely it must know what the answer for this uh, riddle is. And let's see for ourselves. So I loaded up uh, uh, chat, uh, chat GPT with the setting. If you pay, I think $20, you get the option to set the model that you want to use. And uh, I chose uh, GPT-4 and posed the same uh, small problem that we were dealing with in the previous slide. And you can see that even, even GPT-4 is unable to solve it. So just something to keep in mind whenever you want to elicit these one single word uh, uh, answers. Okay, so whenever we, uh, all of the prompts that we have used so far used uh, uh, our so-called zero shot. And in this zero shot prompting, the model is able to complete a specific task without any prior knowledge of, or fine tuning related to this task. And it's called zero shot because we are not providing any examples, we're just giving instructions like we did here. So in this example here, I'm using a, a prompt template and a prompt node. Uh, prompt text has this um, simple instruction to extract the keywords from the text below. And of course, this text is a, a template variable that is declared uh, just below. I took this text from, I, I think it was CNN or something about uh, latest troubles that Donald, former president Donald Trump got himself into. And uh, by simple creation of this prompt template and injection of this variable text, we are able to elicit a response, which is pretty good, I would say. Uh, for the first try, we have some, uh, uh, we have extracted some of the keywords. We have former President Donald Trump, author authorities, New York. But this turn himself in seems like a more like a verb to me than anything else. So. You can see that the zero shot is sometimes with, with these short uh, instructions that are kind of um, vague, are not always uh, achieving our objective. And in this case, I wanted to kind of uh, uh, replicate this task of uh, named entity uh, recognition. So uh, what I would do next normally is go through the iterations of improving this prompt while to get the, uh, the right responses. But this, in this case, let's just assume that we were not uh, able to achieve that even with a few iterations of this uh, prompt. And uh, the next step we would uh, do would be to continue with the, a few shot prompts. And the few shot uh, prompting, uh, what we are basically doing, we're using the same instructions, but we are providing examples to our model. And by giving an example of texts and keywords, just like we learn uh, from an example, uh, this uh, model, it would be able to deduce what we are actually uh, uh, asking it to achieve, even, with the, even if the prompt is uh, uh, a little bit vague and short and uh, not um, uh, clear and specific as we want it uh, to be. So with just two examples, I'm able to then again inject this uh, text uh, from the previous uh, slide into this um, particular position of the prompt and uh, send this uh, template uh, uh, to the large language model that in this case is able to respond much, much better uh, and align with my objective of uh, extracting these uh, keywords. Okay, uh, so, uh, now that we have covered these uh, fundamentals and uh, looked at the examples, it, I think it's much, much easier to uh, summarize these guidelines or tips and tricks as you would find them on the internet yourself. So let's just briefly summarize them. I would say that one of the most important is to provide the clear and explicit instructions because we are ensuring this way that the intended context and the um, uh, output are uh, exactly what we want. Ambiguous or vague prompts can lead to 
irrelevant and unhelpful uh, responses. And by specifying, um, being specific about the task format, uh, you can uh, effectively guide large language models towards the generating the uh, exact output that you uh, are looking for. Then if everything fails, if we fail in these first iterations, I would then uh, go to the step of including examples. Um, and these examples provide this even more context and uh, helps help LLM understand the desired output uh, uh, format and, and style. Just be uh, careful that in these some of situations you are not over constraining the model. So it kind of uh, puts carbon copies of the of the responses, but we should allow it some freedom uh, in, in creativity. Then we would experiment with different uh, prompt styles. Uh, like once again, remember that if you are asking a, a large language model to provide this one word response, this may be not something we should do, but we should think about rephrasing, uh, being more clear and specific, using some open-ended instructions to elicit more comprehensive responses. Uh, a few other things we can do. You're all familiar with temperature and token limits. Uh, temperature enables us, um, the lower temperature enables us uh, to have responses that are more uh, conservative uh, expected. While if we increase the temperature, we allow model to be more creative and use one of these more random words uh, that uh, fit the context. By token limit, of course, we can limit the number of outputs, but there are other ways, maybe just as you will see shortly in the uh, example that I will provide, we can even specify uh, clearly how many sentences we want in the response and the model uh, that follows instructions should be able to uh, fulfill our uh, uh, objective. Then just like in normal uh, software uh, development uh, cycle, we need to iterate uh, I usually start with a simple prompt that I can first think of. I uh, select about 10 samples uh, or a dozen samples, and then I iterate and refine these uh, prompts based on these um, uh, guidelines and the fundamentals that we've learned, but also based on the feedback. You, you have to kind of be, they call it uh, a psychologist of a large language model or whisperer, you know, maybe even more fancy. Uh, uh, to understand and, and to feel the large language model and its uh, responses. Of course, as the last step, we should always be aware of these uh, biases that we introduce ourselves. One of the, I would say, biggest biases is using of these leading words, because with these leading words, we can nudge the model into a specific kind of a, a direction. We should also be aware and ask our colleagues to see if our prompt introduces some biases, but we should also be aware of the biases that the large language models have in the training data and think how we can counteract them. All right, so to uh, conclude this uh, section, I would go through what I think is a very interesting example. Um, and uh, I don't know about your hobbies, but I'm an avid skier, so I took this opportunity to have a bit of fun. Uh, and uh, what I did was the objective was to create kind of a catalog of all the skis that I'm uh, like. Uh, and in this example, I'm just using one uh, Dinostar Speed 963, but uh, uh, you can easily imagine a list uh, of these uh, um, uh, ski types that we can quickly feed into this pipeline and get the examples, uh, the example summaries. So I'm just going to quickly introduce the uh, uh, what's going on here in this slide. We have two prompts. This is on the top. I have the base prompt that we talked about that you usually start with. And the second prompt is a final prompt that we uh, kind of conclude this exercise with. We're using the already familiar prompt node. Nothing uh, too specific about it. We are using DaVinci 03. Uh, we have max length here specified. And we are using also a new component that we introduced in Haystack 115, which is a web retriever. Uh, and web retriever is a component that uh, can search the uh, internet using the Google search or any other search engine for that matter, and can follow these links to strip up, to strip the, the links 
uh, and convert them into these pre-processed documents, raw text basically of the certain size that we specify. And uh, thus we are able to effectively do what this pipeline is, uh, web QA. Um, so what I'm essentially doing here is I'm doing a, a, issuing a Google search query for Dynastar, Dynastar Speed 963. The links are uh, picked up from Google. We traverse five of these links and pick uh, the content stripped HTML and uh, convert it into the raw process text documents of the size of, I think, default setting is about uh, 150, 100 words uh, paragraphs. And another part that we're introducing here is the are these functions. So if you can look at the uh, prompts at the top and uh, they are using this join function. And what join does is that all of these documents that are fed from the pipeline by the retriever, we are joining them into a raw text essentially with the new line between. So uh, when we expand these prompts, they are going to basically look like describe dinner star speed 9, 963 in a few sentences using document pro documents provided below. And these documents would then just list uh, a few documents as raw text. And uh, as you can see, the second prompt is a bit more elaborate and it's using all of these kind of guidelines that we have mentioned uh, so far. So let's just read it together. Uh, I'm saying craft a three to five sentence description about query, ensuring that it's concise and informative. Uh, start by introducing the skis names and types, discuss the ski building technology used and finally highlight the main benefits. So by using these clear and specific prompts, I'm actually uh, shaping up the output uh, so that the model can first mention this, the type of the skis, the ski building technology, and then conclude the uh, output with the main benefits. And of course, all of this information is going to be picked up from the documents that we uh, are uh, injecting into this uh, pipeline. We also specify format that we should use skier specific terminology for more engaging and relatable description, drawing information exclusively from the provided uh, text. So I would say pretty clear uh, and specific. Uh, uh, we are specifying the, the output that we want, the language, the structure, and we can see the results on the next slide. So the first prompt, the result I would say is good, but I mean, it's definitely related to Dynastar Speed 90, 963, but it kind of doesn't, doesn't have a structure, talks about immediately construction of these keys, um, specifying some of the features, um, listing them, while the second prompt that we have uh, developed is now following all of this format that we actually desired. It starts with a uh, Dinastar Star Speed 963 immediately, saying how it's a perfect choice for skiers. Um, and then it goes on to the uh, technology, uh, ski building technology that it was used. And finally concluding this paragraph by uh, listing the main benefits, uh, highlighting main benefits, which is that it's advanced for, for advanced and ex expert skiers looking for a reliable and comfortable and agile ride. Now imagine you can pretty much do this yourself in similar kinds of situations uh, with a, I would, I would always use these uh, kind of a base prompt and, and uh, uh, final prompt. So you can see the output of both and the progress that you're making in this iterative uh, process of uh, uh, shaping your uh, prompt. Okay, so it's just a, a fair, uh, it's also fair enough that we mentioned briefly these uh, uh, common prompting pitfalls. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, using ambiguous and vague instructions is opposite to the first one that we had. Uh, if we uh, are uh, actually not helping LLMs, they will struggle to decipher the intended context and goal resulting in the outputs that don't align with the desired uh, outcome. It's crucial that we provide clear and explicit instructions so the model can have easier time responding. If we use overly complex or lengthy prompts, again, 
we're going to have a uh, give our attention mechanism and the context window might overflow so we might not even get the response that we want and even the pattern of the words that we use should be something that's uh, super familiar to light up to that attention mechanism so it can recognize immediately what the uh, 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 intended uh, objective of our prompt uh, is. And uh, one more time to mention is not to use the single token answers requests uh, from the large language model because usually, unless we are dealing with super simple tasks, we are likely to fail um, and we should always allow uh, large language models to chat a bit, to feed on its own uh, response, to navigate to the right um, outcome that we want. Okay, so before we move towards the conclusion of this presentation, I just want to briefly look at the latest research related, uh, latest research uh, in the field. And why not think of an obvious idea? And that's to use large language models to automatically generate these prompts for us. So this is what the Zhu and his colleagues at University of Toronto did. I actually personally played with this. Uh, this is, it's a public project. And it has two language models, large language models. One is in blue one is essentially given a only a set of demonstration inputs and outputs. In this case, prove, disprove on and off and obviously it's it's uh, we are dealing with antonyms and uh, 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 general instruction is written to the uh, to this uh, model is given to this model and the model comes with a proposal that you know it might be the prompt behind this is to reverse the input and another model is then scoring these uh, suggestions for the prompt uh, and also uh, making a resampling of these uh, suggested prompts, in this case, finally re finally arriving to the highest scoring, write the antonym of the word uh, prompt uh, through this iterative kind of a, a black box optimization uh, approach to, to finally to, to uh, arrive at the uh, ideal prompt. And the, the authors, I would suggest you read this, have uh, uh, look up this uh, research paper, have all kinds of suggestions that they have uh, come to uh, by using this uh, automatic prompt engineer. Then even simpler approach uh, was suggested by Wang and his colleagues at Google Brain. So instead of just, yes, remember our small riddle, uh, instead of just uh, soliciting one response, we can solicit multiple responses from the large language models. And this is what these uh, various uh, suggestions here, so, uh, are here. So we sample a diverse set of reasoning paths for this riddle about the eggs uh, and how much the eggs uh, cost in total. And then we have three of these reasoning paths. One of them is reaching the wrong answer. And the we basically just vote by majority here. Uh, so without relying on one reasoning path that we elicit from the LLM, uh, we uh, elicit multiple of these uh, uh, reasoning paths just by changing the temperature slightly. And then uh, by uh, uh, voting majority, we conclude that the right answer in this case is uh, $18. And the last uh, paper that I want to mention is uh, by Zelinkman and uh, uh, his colleagues at Stanford and Google Research. And this is a kind of a, a ultimate approach where, again, we have these rationales, which is they are just these reasoning paths where a large language model is um, generating uh, reasoning paths and attempting to answer. If the answer is correct, then we kind of put it into this training set of question, rational answer triples. And if the model doesn't ans answer correctly, we kind of give it a hint about the answer so we can elicit a better rationale or this reasoning path. And if the, in this case, after hinting, the model is able to, to uh, produce the correct rationale, sorry, correct answer, we take that rationale uh, or reasoning path and then we then again add it to this triple. And then we continue to fine tune this large language model. So this is a very interesting setup 
that has been used in a couple of recent papers um, that are coming out in just last couple of weeks, uh, which is this uh, ultimate self-tuning uh, large language model. Okay, so I have a small uh, uh, encore uh, for you guys. And uh, as I've already hinted, hinted in this eight, um, automatic prompt engineer, nobody prevents us from using uh, chat GPT or GPT-4 as, the, as this uh, additional tool that help us um, create perfect prompts. So if you uh, scan this um, um, code here, you will get the link to uh, a recent post on Reddit that I found, which is essentially now repeating all of these. We can look at it together. Uh, it's repeating all of these guidelines that we have uh, seen. So at the end, you would basically insert your prompt. And here are all of the instructions that we give to the large language model. Uh, uh, so what we are doing, first notice how the author is doing this uh, uh, cleverly. He's separating the sections of these instructions uh, uh, or they are separating. So first, uh, they uh, are they ask the model to identify the main subject and the objective to add the context again now here's the specificity to ensure the specificity to use the clear and concise language uh, to incorporate open-ended questions to avoid leading questions to provide instructions when necessary and at the end uh, you're basically inserting your current prompt or the prompt that you have in your uh, current iteration of development and then the model would be able to hopefully help you uh, craft this uh, perfect prompt for your uh, task. Okay, and I would say that this would conclude our presentation. We have uh, just about enough time for the question and answering, and I'll leave this slide open for some of the uh, resources that you might use. Um, mostly prompting guide and learning uh, learn prompting. Lillian Wang, of course, if you're familiar with her uh, uh, blog posts, they are super useful. And there's an even course now uh, by Elvis from Adair, and it costs $700 and spends even like, I think, four or five days of prompt engineering if you're into potentially consider that. And with that, I'll uh, hand it over to back to Tuana. Thank you, Vladimir. Um, honestly, I ended up leaving. Uh, we uh, asked maybe a few questions with, with Birge, but most of them are such good questions that we decided to leave most to you because it feels like it's worth answering live. So I'm going to do my best to go through them as much as possible. So there were a few questions from Raja. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, um, but I'm going to start with their questions. Uh, does choice of word play a role in the end result of the LLM? And what do you mean by LLM represents a world model? Okay, so the first part of the question, I would say yes. Uh, it's like super important, the choice of words. Uh, if you remember that slide with the attention mechanism, uh, if you are using the words that are unusual in the context, that are not usually going together, uh, so maybe this happens sometimes. I'm English is not like my first language, uh, uh, although I lived in Canada for 20 years. Um, still, I would make mistakes and probably um, some also non-English speakers, non-native speakers might use some pattern of words that is unusual, uh, that hasn't been seen. And the attention mechanism might have harder time identifying um, these uh, these specific patterns of uh, words. And the uh, second part is that uh, the uh, large language model has what I think is uh, how is it able to do some of these things? I think that uh, uh, it, after seeing uh, uh, tons and tons of text from the internet, uh, I think I forgot what the actual number is, so I'm not going to say it. But it is essentially sucking the entire internet uh, and uh, uh, passing them through the neural networks. I think it's more than statistical correlation between the words. 
and it's kind of a compressed knowledge of everything that it has uh, read. It doesn't not it's not only you know oh is this token related to the other token, but there's something happening, and this is also a, an ongoing debate of what is this ha what's happening inside these neural networks in the transformers architecture that is uh, able to capture some of this knowledge so effectively. That's what I would say. So the large language model basically has a snapshot in time of world knowledge and that's... Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Okay. Um, all right, so the next question is from Krishna and I decided to leave this one because uh, my imagination went to the answer to this might actually be something we just introduced in Haystack, which is agents and agent tools. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the question is, is there a way to not search document stores in, uh, and give invalid request as a response? When we call the query uh, API with invalid queries like greetings or random words, which are out of context for document store data. Well, I'm not sure, really sure what the um, uh, this audience member so, is referring to. So I think the question is, how can I handle if um, I'm getting a query in uh, that is completely unrelated to the data that I have at hand, and I don't actually want to be answering questions about this. And what I went to think was a description of a tool. And if you do not have a tool that's uh, you know useful to answer greetings, you may make it uh, make your agent do something a bit different. Uh, yes, I would. I would have to see. Uh, maybe this person can contact me directly, and I can look at the more concrete uh, uh, example of what's going on, and then we can take it offline. Okay, um, in that case, I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, is there any research showing which leading words or helping phrases like let's think step by step work best? Uh, yeah, there are ongoing debates. I think that the best way is to understand the these underlying uh, principles where these uh, leading words uh, uh, arrive from. And uh, uh my colleagues and i at core team have used this in agent ourselves we have experimented with a couple of different not always let's think step by step but to kind of um, understand the context of what they need to do what is the best leading word we can think of and then kind of go through this process of iteration experimentation of uh using multiple samples dozen um two dozen samples and seeing what kind of responses we get and iterate through it then. Um, all right, so next one. Uh, this is, I think, quite a technical question. Could you talk about the top K, say top K equals five parameter in the reader and generator, whether the model is providing five answers all at once uh, with some variation, so a single API hit, or whether we actually uh, provide one answer at a time, but five different uh, API calls to the model? Uh, I'm not quite sure without looking at the documentation myself, but uh, there is some sort of search ranking and the top five results from this uh, search, I, uh, some sort of similarity is used, some sort of metric. And then the top five results are what is passed to the uh, actual model to help it uh, use it as a context to uh, to generate a response. Uh, depends, of course, what kind of a model they use. Um, but uh, you know, you, you can do these kind of things with LLMs as well, and prompt templates, and prompt node in 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 uh, Haystack. Um, we have another question from the same person, and I also often wonder this. Um, I think. We can maybe even do a whole session about this topic um, itself, but the question is, what would be your uh, what would be the ideal temperature parameter? Well, it depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to um, have more uh, constrained output of um, I don't know um, uh, less creative. I, you know, I mean, if you're writing poems, you're not gonna have a parameter of zero point one. Uh, but maybe you know higher. Uh, so I would experiment. Depends on the use case. Uh, that's the that's the kind of best answer I can think of. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, and we've, we've got more questions even still coming in, so I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer all of them. Uh, so I'm going to be picking some that I also find interesting and think people might uh, benefit from. So uh, there's one question. I've observed the difference between using DaVinci and other open source models. The thing is the open source models like GPTJ don't end sentences correctly. They like to leave a, set, a sentence in between how to avoid that, especially in generative QA scenarios. Uh, yes, I have seen that as well. Uh, and to be honest, I would have to devote some time to actually look uh, myself and to experiment with all of the, the best I can think of is uh, look at the generate uh, quarks parameter that is passed uh, to the pipelines or the to the generate method. And there is a hugging face blog about generation that explains in details of what uh, how generation of text is done and what all of the parameters uh, mean. If you look up, if just to Google search uh, on hugging face blog generate, I th I think I forgot who actually wrote it, but uh, it was one of the best articles I could find about text generation. Um, okay, we have maybe five to eight more minutes, so I'm going to continue down. Um, can you talk a bit about the new agents you announced recently for Haystack? What use cases do you have in mind? Will you invest more uh, in creating tools in the future? Yes, uh, this is something that we are also uh, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, throwing it out to the customers and the uh, users to see what are the use cases that they have. Uh, we have a couple of, we know that they can be used with these uh, search pipelines. Uh, sometimes uh, the agent should, uh, should be able to easily decide if it wants to use some existing pipeline or it needs to go on the uh, web, using web retriever to, to find an answer, for, for example, for a question that it doesn't find uh, locally then uh, we are envisioning use of conversational agents. These conversational agents need uh, memory. Uh, then uh, we are going to employ some of these, um, uh, uh, some of this latest research that you have seen. There's this reflection framework that enables models to uh, criticize uh, each other in the responses to try to find the flaw in their reasoning paths so they can uh, attempt to answer the, uh, um, uh, to correct the path of the uh, kind of uh, this reasoning path and uh, uh, answer correctly. So we are mostly now experimenting and seeing what our users need and trying to follow that as a signal. Um, I'm going to group two questions here because they're very similar to each other. Um, uh, one is, is it possible to use a large database of documents, for example, 1,000 PDFs with text, as the basis for a prompt? I see it. Uh, I see this as difficult because the model has a limitation of words. And then someone else also asked something I see very similar. Uh, thank you. When querying the documents, we basically pass the top K relevant documents in the prompt with the question. So I have two questions regarding that. First is can the can can it happen that the prompt becomes too big when uh, like i choose a top 20 docs and exceed the limit of the context window and second is what if instead we fine tune the model and ask the question without giving the context to avoid the first problem yeah certainly so, you can you can always train it on on the uh, specific data but i would say that's the last step uh, if you have exhausted all of the other options uh, I'm, I'm also curious, what's the use case where you need to put 20 documents into the, um, maybe you can separate this problem into a series of problems that you can, uh, as always in computer science, you can kind of attack this uh, uh, large problem with a series of smaller problems that you can solve and then group them and somehow uh, find the correct answer. But always keep in mind that the context uh, sequence length is, uh, relatively small uh, and how you can use it the best so it, it has to include both the prompt and the response um i was also going to suggest maybe uh do you think it's a 
valid um, way to work if we were to, for example, retrieve the top 20 documents, but then have first a summarization step for all of those documents and then provide that yeah. as a single document. Exactly, something like this. So maybe uh, first for all of these 20 documents, run a summarization step where you can fit each document into a um, context window, I suppose. Uh, 4,000 words on, on DaVinci is not uh, little. Uh, so it's a decent sized document. I would say it's at least five or six pages of text. And um, then in, in this step, uh, instruct the model how you want to summarize this text. Um, after you get the summaries, you get a compressed kind of uh, a version of this document, and then you might use it in the next step uh, uh, to solve the original task that you had in mind. I will only ask two more questions. We don't have much time left. Uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, Valentina asks, it seems that models work better with do prompts rather than don't prompts. Any ideas why that is? Yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, I think that the um, space of uh, being um, extracting what to do is much more constrained than the don't. Because when you say don't do this, well, what do you mean? What should I do then, right? You're just eliminating one or two, possi one or two possibilities. And um, I think that the it's better to uh, provide, uh, I've seen this in literature as well, but to be honest, I have to think about this uh, and experiment myself uh, to understand this uh, subject matter a bit better. Okay, then I've got one last question for you. Uh, this was, I tried to answer this in chat. I clarified that um, they're not asking you about caching. Is there any way to get the same answer all the time for a given prompt? And I asked, uh, I replied saying some caching uh, might be needed as far as I know, um, but they're asking if it's possible just with the LLM. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think that if you use a super low temperature, you might have a, a, a chance of uh, eliciting by greedy decoding, you'll have a chance of doing this, but I'm not sure 100% if it's guaranteed. I don't think so. All right. I think with that, I'm going to say thank you, Vladimir, for taking the time to do this webinar. Um, I think we will definitely try to have some more to everyone still in the uh, webinar. Um, we have a Discord server for Haystack and we try to be as active as possible there. So if you do have any questions about Haystack, don't hesitate to ask. And we try to have as many office hours as possible where we just chat about NLP and Haystack topics we're interested in that week. Uh, so do come and join us and hopefully we can have more of these uh, soon. Have a lovely evening. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Thank you, Tuana. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.